Hi, everybody. You know, I think you could not have had an unlikely person to be welcoming you tonight. Firstly, I've got a, a really weird name. I mean, it's very long and odd. In fact, I have a number as a name because my name, if you translate it into English, is Chesoni, is Jason, and Vitu Sangaburu is 70. Because when I was born, my grandfather was 70 years old and his name was Chesoni. So that's how I was named. Chesoni Vitu Sangaburu. So I've got a number for a name, you know. So if you forget my name, just call me 70, I'll respond to that. You know? <laughs> but you know, in Fiji, in the part of Fiji I come from, we name people after events. So you can have very long names, like Talembula Mai China, just one name, you know. It means returned alive from China, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, like I said, uh, you couldn't have an unlikely person to be welcoming you today to the um, Baltimore, Washington metropolitan area. And, um, you know, f uh, firstly, I mean, I'm, I'm not anybody important. I mean, like, for a, for a function like this, you should have the mayor to be here, you know, w welcoming you. I mean, I've got the pictures of the mayor of Baltimore and Washington here. I don't look like them, right? I mean, uh, and also, you've come to a very important part of the country and there's no shortage of dignitaries who you can choose from to come and welcome you. I mean, I could even imagine a representative from the Federal Treasury to come and welcome you. Why? Because international students contribute $30 billion a year to the U.S. economy. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just an ordinary resident of this area, and a more recent one at that. And I've just been here 10 years. Uh, live in Silver Spring, and the slide's going to come up, and, uh, you know, there's nothing to boast about Silver Spring except it's the headquarters of national, uh, uh, yeah, the communication, uh, I beg your pardon, discovery communication. But for the best part of my life, I have lived in a very small and remote country in the world. Um, Fiji is about 12,500 kilometers from here, far, far away. Now, for some of you, you might not even know where Fiji is, you know, and I don't blame you because it's so, so small. I remember when I was studying in the UK, this guy from Nigeria comes up to me and says, Vitu, where are you from? I said, I'm from Fiji. Fiji? Where's that? You know, as, as if I'm from Mars, you know. And then I said, okay, come here. I show him Fiji on the world map, you know, there's a map that's going to come up. If you see that map, Fiji is nearly falling off the edge to begin with, you know, of the world, you know. So I said to him, here. This is where I come from. And the guy goes, oh, you must know how to swim, right? <laughs> and I said, well, I should show you where I grew up. Because it's an even tiny little island, and it's, it's on the screen as well. And you think I live amongst the fishes? Because it doesn't exist uh, on, on, you know, on the map. But you know, as I think about it, with climate change, the way it's happening, I mean, my island, it's the highest point is only 60 meters above sea level, 200 feet, you know. So I, I'm really worried that one day I'll be living amongst the fishes, you know, in the not too distant future. But, uh, um, <laughs> but maybe I'm being invited to speak to you today because I am, my name, I'm called Ambassador V2. But then I'm a former ambassador. I mean, surely. And I was ambassador for only two years. And, this ambassadorial post was my one and only diplomatic posting, you know. Didn't do anything special and was removed rather unceremoniously before I could serve my full term. And uh, I was removed after a military coup in Fiji in 2006. The new regime must have figured, ah, we couldn't rely on him to lie for us, you know. And, you know, somebody has defined an ambassador. Uh, uh, I think it was Sir Henry Wooten. 17th century English diplomat who said that ambassador, an ambassador is an honest gentleman sent to lie abroad for the good of his country. <laughs> and still, I am really happy to be welcoming you today, you know, although my credential is not too good, but I am happy. Um, who wouldn't, man? I mean, you have come to one of the most exciting places in America. It's home of about 10 million people, the national capital region, is the most educated and by some measure the most affluent metropolitan area in the United States of America. Although not, not, mo, not uh, very popular as a place for study because most students gravitate to California and New York 
for example, uh, we still have our fair share of students that come here. At 12%, uh, Washington DC has the highest percentage of international student compared to total enrollment. Um, National Capital Region is the seat of federal government, which uh, makes decisions that affect not only this country, but many countries in the world, uh, given the way we are inextricably linked. It's also the location of famous international organizations like the World Bank and IMF. Uh, no wonder this place is uh, referred to as the capital of the world. Uh, most of you are STEM students, right? Studying science, technology, engineering, and math and uh, business management as well. So you will be happy to know that this region is the home of many biotechnology and defense contracting companies, international hotels and banks, um, United Therapeutics, the Institute of Genomic Research, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Booz Allen, Marriott, Fannie Mae, Capital One, to name just a few. I, I don't know the composition of the people here, but if it mirrors the breakdown of the one million uh, international students in America, 31% of you would be Chinese, right? 31%? Yeah, yeah. And, and about 14% Indians? Yeah, right, right. And 7% Korean? Yeah. And 6% Saudi Arabia and 42% others. So, it, the demographic of this uh, region, the demographic of re this region is quite multiracial, racial, that 18% of all the people who live here are foreign born, about 40% Latin American and 37% Asian. So we could easily get someone here to welcome you in your own language. But let me hasten, let me try, right? In Chinese, don't you say, ni hao? <laughs> uh, and in Hindi? Uh, I would like to say namatse sabagat he and Korean <laughs> and young SEO <laughs> and Saudi Arabia Maraban, is it? Okay, sorry, I must have butchered those greetings. But here's a greeting that I cannot butcher. It's short and sweet. Bula! You can say it, it's a greeting from Fiji. <laughs> Bula. <laughs> yes, Bula. And uh, Fiji is the home of, uh, I don't know whether you know, at the last Olympic, uh, Fiji won its first medal ever. I mean, it's been coming to the Olympics for 60 years. And its very first medal happens to be a gold medal. I know some of the countries here play rugby. We are the king of rugby sevens, Fiji. But I know some of you don't play rugby. I mean, many of you don't play rugby, so you don't know what I'm talking about. But this is something you will definitely know. Fiji's most important export to the world. Fiji water. <laughs> I remember when David Gilmore came to start Fiji water in Fiji, I was then the chief executive of the Fiji Trade and Investment Bureau, which approves foreign investment certificate to foreign investors. He comes up to my room and said, Vitu, you must approve this foreign certificate application. And I say, why, David? Because Fiji water will one day become Fiji's biggest export. At that time, sugar was Fiji's biggest export, doing 400 million. And I'm saying, here's this guy who says, water? to be Fiji's major export, biggest export, Eclipse Sugar? You gotta be kidding, you know, but I didn't tell him that, you know, but I did go ahead and approve his application for foreign investment certificate. Boy, wasn't he thinking ahead, he clearly had vision. Today, it is Fiji's largest export, doing about 100 million to the US alone. And to me, I mean, it should encourage many of you who study marketing, because here is a, a wonderful example of how clever marketing can really score in a very perceptive market like you have in the US. Fiji water has eclipsed Evian as the most popular imported water here. And thanks to the clever marketing that we, we do. I mean, I remember uh, when I was speaking to David Gilmore, he told me something that has uh, lingered in my mind. He said, Vitu, 
Uh, you know what we, why is Fiji Water so successful? Say, why David? Because this is what we do. We, folk, we concentrate, when we are doing work, we focus on the ball and the scorecard will take care of itself. So this is something that, I've, that I thought, hey, this is a good advice to keep. I mean, and I'm telling you as a student, concentrate on the ball and the scorecard will take care of itself. So anyway, um, that's by way of introduction. But really, I know why I'm here to speak to you, because I have a story to tell. So this is story time, right? I'm here because I have lots of story, but and for a person who's lived three score years and one, he should have many stories. Okay, forget about the maths, I'm 61 years old, right? <laughs> and, uh, but I tell you, I have no better story to tell than my faith in Jesus Christ. And I've been walking with him since 1975, in my first year at the University of the South Pacific, my picture of the university is on the slide, and I, one day this guy comes up to me and said, Vidu, are you a Christian? And I said, of course I'm a Christian. How do you know? Well, I go to church, I read the Bible, I pray, all those churchy, churchy things you do. And he says, okay, good. Do you know what the Bible says how one becomes a Christian? And I said, isn't that it? He said, well, let me show you a few verses. So he proceeded to share me. There was a booklet that we used to have in Camps Crusade in the past called Four Spiritual Laws. That's what he shared with me. And it struck me what he said that, you know, like, God loves me and has got a wonderful plan for my life and so on. You know, he backed it up with verses and the way to experience it is to seek Christ to come into our life, accept Christ to come into my, our life. And the way we do not experience God's love is because of our sin. Things like that, that is in the four laws. You know, for a while I was thinking, uh, what's this American thing this guy is trying to tell me? But then I'm so glad I humbled myself and I accepted Christ to come into my life on that day in 1975. And it's the most wonderful decision that I've made in my life. And you know, uh, my life has changed in many ways, but the most important way it has changed, you know, I wasn't a... I wasn't a bad guy before. I think the most important thing that happened in my life is to begin to see God as a loving God, as a person who's interested in my welfare, wants to hold my hand and take me on this journey that I'm traveling in. You know, I, before I used to look upon God as somebody sitting up in heaven, he's got a stick in his hand, only interested in me when I do something wrong and he'd whack me, you know. Uh, I don't know how this image came up, maybe because in the village church where I grew up, you know, when you go to church, the kids would sit on the floor, and there's an adult that would sit next to them, he's got a stick in his hand, so that, you know, you don't poke each other during the service, and when you do, he would whack you. And then, and then when the preacher would stand up and pray, he would go, Hoi, come on, you know, like shouting at the top of his voice, and I'm thinking, Maybe God is very far. That's why this guy is <laughs> shouting at the top of his voice. And then this guy's got a stick in his hand. So that was my image of God. He was way up there, very far. Flary eyes, got a stick in his hand, only interested in me when I do something wrong. So I was worshipping him more out of fear than of, you know, real love for him. So I'm so glad that uh, that's the way mm, the most important a way in which my life had been changed to begin to see God as a, as a friend uh, in a new light altogether. Now, uh, then began, you know, one of the most exciting journeys of my life. And when I went to England, I was in England from 1984 to 86 doing my master's. Um, I think, you know, studying abroad can be one of the most exciting time in our lives, right? I, I certainly felt that way. But for a Christian, it can be a really testing time also in, in our life. And I can tell you that my faith was really shaken when I was uh, studying in the UK. Um, you know, over there, you get accosted with questions that are really, really searching. I remember, you know, I was enthusiastic going door to door, knocking, trying to share my faith with the people. And then they would pose questions that, you know, really floored me. I didn't have an answer for. Like, if God's so loving, why is there so much misery in the world today? You know, what's the big deal about giving us free will if we're going to misuse it or abuse it anyway? So, for a while, 
I became skeptical about my faith and I stopped reading the Bible, I stopped praying and then I thought, then I thought, oh, one of these days the sky would fall on me because I have moved away from God. But nothing like that happened. If anything, I continued to experience God's amazing love towards me. And I hearken back to the time when I came to know Christ, how the guy shared with me that God really loves me and has got a wonderful plan for me. And so what, what happened is, you know, I, 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 I had a lot of questions, but also when I was walking not with him, I still had a lot of questions. So the thing that I really stumbled on, oh, I, I couldn't get through, is Jesus Christ and the words he had to say. And the more I thought about what he had to say, the more I said, no, I have to accept this. I mean, I came to, my, came to the conclusion that, you know, my mind is so finite and I'm trying to understand an infinite God. So for me, if Jesus says it, I believe it. That's the conclusion I had come to. And so, I, you know, I came back, returned to Fiji, really encouraging my faith, you know, ever more excited to serve God faithfully. But one of the things that happens, you know, life is full of surprises. Um, when I was posted here, um, my faith was really tested again in that um, I mentioned earlier that there was a coup in Fiji and that I had barely served my term for 24 months when I was stood down because of the military coup in Fiji. And it happened very abruptly. I mean, I, I can still remember on the 7th of July, 2007, I was at Capitol Hill with my family to watch fireworks and I got a call from Fiji to say, 10 o'clock tomorrow, you will have to move out of the residence. I said, what? I mean, just imagine that here in Washington, D.C., all of a sudden giving, given your marching order to move out of the residence by 10 o'clock the following day. I told my family, we're not going to wait for the fireworks. There's bigger fireworks at home. So let's go back home, right? So I remember riding the train back home and thinking, God, what's happening to me? You know, and then I was thinking, God, did I hear you correctly in coming to D.C. in the first place? Because I prayed to see God's decision or guidance in deciding whether I should take up this post. I remember the guy from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs calling me and said, V2, um, we were wondering whether you would like to take up the ambassadorial position in Washington, D.C. And at that time, I had just finished from being the Chief Executive for Foreign Investment Trade in Fiji, and I was I started my business, you know, and a consultancy business, which was going very well. And I did that because I felt God wanted me to be doing this so that I free up my time to be serving him instead of being restricted when you are working for somebody else. So I didn't think that this detour was part of God's plan for me. I thought he wanted me to be in the business. But anyway, the guy who called happens to be a Christian and he said, Vitu, why don't you pray about it? And I said, okay, makes sense. So I prayed about it. And you know, sometimes it can be very difficult to determine what's God's will for your life, you know? How do you know? So I just read the scriptures and the scriptures talk about the Gideon test, right? You know, you put out something and it goes one way and you know it's God's will. That's basically how I approached it. You know, for you to come to be a, 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 an ambassador in a country, your agramon or your uh, resume needs to be first accepted by the country that you are going to. So I said, God, I'm going to say yes. Now, if you don't want me to go, then my agramon should not be accepted. But it was accepted. So I knew full well in my heart that I was coming here with God's blessing. So when this thing happened, I said, God, what's happening here? But you know, it's the most amazing thing is this, that when you face difficulties like that, it's an opportunity for you to really experience God's power in your life. You know, I think challenges, I've learned to, to accept this. This challenges is put there so that you can experience this great and mighty God that you serve in your life. So it's been wonderful. I mean, the last 10 years, as I mentioned, has been a very difficult time in my life, but it's also been a very enriching time. 
I mean, I could not have been set adrift in this place at the worst time in 2008. That's when we had the meltdown in America. But God has been looking after me every step of the way and taking real good care of me. You know, when it comes to uh, a visa that I should have, I was given the O visa, which is only made available to people of extraordinary ability. And it, it was as if God was saying, my son, I will take care of you and I will give you a visa that I don't know whether anybody in Fiji has ever got or not. Again, I'm saying this because when you face difficulties and challenges, this is one of the best things that can happen to you because you learn to draw close uh, to God as a result. So, um, the last 10 years has been the most challenging time of my life and family, but it's also been the most exciting, and we see the hand of God guiding us and providing for us every step of the way. You know, your, the conference is, uh, theme is known, to be fully known and to be fully loved by God. How I appreciate God's companionship in my life. There are a number of characteristics that I really love about this God that I serve. His love, His mercy, His power, and the fact that He gives eternal life as a gift. You know, one, the other important thing that I'm really happy about is that He's an all-knowing God. That means I don't have to explain in detail to him my problems. He knows them even before I mention them. I don't know what the future holds for me. I'm still going through challenges and difficulties, but I know who holds the future. You know, you have your life ahead of you. How would you like to have as a companion this loving, merciful, powerful, and all-knowing God and who offers eternal life as a gift? Finally, I hope you gain a lot from this conference and you enjoy the rich fellowship and make new friends and grow in your faith. Keep an open mind about the issues of life. Enjoy your time in DC. May you return to your university and choose to resume your studies and I wish you great success in them. May 2018 be an exciting, successful and happy year for you all. Happy New Year. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very, very much for the message that I've just shared with uh, the wonderful people gathered in the auditorium today, Heavenly Father. You know, thank you for your faithfulness to a mere person like me. And thank you that your faithfulness, people here can experience also when they have a personal relationship with you. I pray that the time that these wonderful people will be spending here will be truly enriching, a time to really draw close to you and to know you more in their lives and to realize that you know them and you care for them very, very much. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.